oh, this is too deep for you. He chose the men, he said, but the women follow. See, once males get in position, women know what to do. The simple power of fatherhood. Time Magazine did a research on fathers. I got all the, all the information in my file. Time Magazine. And their conclusion is that all the crime in America is a result of fatherlessness. That's secular research. Fatherlessness. And this book, the reason why I think it's exploded so quickly is because it, it's really a simple concept, but one we missed. For example, in this book I explain the fact that the word father, write the word father down. I'm going to show you something. Everyone write it down. If you're a woman, write it twice. Yeah. A F A T H E R, you get that? Okay. The Hebrew word for father, some of you are here are probably Jewish, you know this word. It's the word ab A B. Some people write it Abba. It can be written, written both ways. Abba Abba. The word Abba is important. The word Abba does not mean male. It does not mean male. The word Abba is the Hebrew word which means source, S-O-U-R-C-E, source. It also means sustainer, sustainer, interesting word. So Abba is the source from which something comes from. And whatever comes from it, it has to sustain it. That's Abba in Hebrew, Abba. Source. The Greek word New Testament for father is the word P A T E R. Pronounce it. Pata. Pata. You can almost hear the word papa there? Yes, Greek word pata. The word pata means the same thing. It means source, sustainer. It also means nourisher. Wow. Women nurture, men nourish. Two different things all together. Now, let me tell you why this book is so important. I'm set, don't miss Saturday morning, okay? Everyone come. If you're a grandmother, come and bring all your grandsons. Because they won't become criminals and have a broken marriage in the future if they understand what I'm going to teach Sunday. You want your marriage to last forever? Come out Saturday morning. I'm going to pour it out to you, then I'm going to get on my flight. I'm going to, I got to leave because I got to be in North Carolina to speak on Saturday night. Now, Look at that word again, Abba. What does it mean? And, in other words, Abba means something that produces something and sustains it. God never calls himself mother. Mothers don't produce anything. This is deep now, you gotta understand me. For example, women did not come from the soil. <laughs> I already got you now, huh? Come stand here with me, man. Stand here for me. Y'all don't forget this, okay? Stand here. Good. In this book, I talk about the fact that men have missed God's understanding of male. Women did not come from the soil. When God wanted to make a, a male, he went to the soil and he formed his body from the dust of the ground. When God wanted to make a female, he didn't do that. He closed the man's eyes and he went inside the man, in the front of the man, and pulled out a piece and he built a woman. Matter of fact, two different ways are used in Hebrew. The first word is form, which means that to carve. The other word is built for the woman, which means that he actually multiplied the, the, the cells. He fashioned it. So women, that's why women are more refined than men. God built women, you know, they built. Yeah. Yeah. Men, they just form. That's why men are not attractive. You know, men are just, just a chunk of stuff. Just, 
But women are, hey. Whew. Fine. That's why I can't understand how a man can be attracted to another man. Look how dumb you look. Just nothing. Gotta be sick to be attracted to another male. Now, I want to show you something. I want to show you something. Okay. Uh, let me just borrow a lady. I'm going to make sure I don't want to borrow no one's wife. So, let me see. Uh, you ain't married yet. Oh, you married? You married? Is he with you? Okay, come. <laughs> Now, I want you to listen, watch this. This is exactly what God did. Stand in the front of him. That is what God did. A woman came out of the front of a man. So the man is actually, a matter of fact, the word Abba also means foundation. The foundation of a building is never on the top. Where is it? The bottom. Why? It carries everything. Abba. He sustains everything. So a man is not the head of the home. He's the foot of the home. And there you got to change your thinking. See, I got you now. That book is, this, book, this book is key. See, the male thinks he's the head of the house. He thinks he's the roof. He's actually what? Matter of fact, the Latin word for Abba is fundus. F-U-N-D-U-S, fundus, which means foundation. That's why we call the founders of America founding fathers. They are at the foundation of the nation. So men are supposed to carry the whole family. The wife, the kids, the bills. All the bills, all. Which means your wife working should be a privilege for you. <laughs> that never goes over good, but that's the truth. Now, watch this. Here's why God said it this way. He is Abba. She came out of him. Now, whatever comes out of you, you have to do what? What's the second word? Sustain. I guarantee you men in this room, I guarantee this. I have been to 89 countries so far, and I've never been wrong yet. I've never met a woman who wanted to go to work. <laughs> In other words, no woman want to have to go. Now, they don't mind going to work. Don't get me wrong. But they don't want to have to go. Look at them heads. Look at them heads. No, that's them heads. No. Mm -hmm. She looking at her, and one husband see a nod. <laughs> Women were not designed by God to have to sustain anything. They were, they were created just to be loved. Just take care of them. Take a deep breath. A woman should go to work because she feels like it, not because she has to. That's why women have so much problems, physically. They were not born to carry the stress. Now, you've been taught by your culture that behind every good man is a good woman. Okay, let's see how that works then. Stand behind him. Now, that means that they head out in life together, but she's behind him. Now, when Satan attacks him, if they fall, who gets crushed? And that's exactly why this city is a mess. Women are carrying loads they're not built to carry. That's why you're divorced. And that's why women want prenuptial agreements. It's ungodly. Yeah. Mm. Prenatural agreement is totally against the kingdom. Totally ungodly. Yeah. It is satanic. But 
It's a result of the male not understanding Abba. So when Satan attacks her, she lands on him. Come on, hold it up. And this is the picture of a family. He's supposed to be the foundation holding up his wife, his kids, the grandkids, the great-grandkids. He is the foundation. And that's why the average woman in this room, which is the one looking at me now, is frustrated because she cannot find a man who will hold her. Come on, ladies, go get a clap. Go ahead and clap. Yeah. Women, therefore, are not looking, write this down. Women, come on, ladies, write this down twice. Women are not looking for lovers. They are looking for foundations. Am I right? Yeah, that's really cool. They're looking for fathers, not lovers. Men think women are looking for a lover. Women are looking for a father. Okay, let me show you this. Let me show you how this works. Have you noticed when God created the male and female, as soon as he made her, Adam started prophesying. Adam started prophesying. Adam says, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. For this cause should a man who leaves, a man leaves. Who leaves? A man leaves his mother and father. In other words, only the man leaves his father. A woman never leaves her father. I'm going to pause for many of you to get that. Some of you are slow. Men leave their fathers. Women never supposed to leave their fathers. Because their husband is supposed to become. I remember Jesus talking to his wife one time. Look at his face. Jesus had a wife? Yes, he did. It's my friend right there. Five. Yeah. Jesus said to his wife, he said, look, sweetheart, I, I've finished the work. I've solved all the problems. He said, now I'm going to my God and to your God. Then he says, to my father and your father. In other words, no matter who covers you, you're covered. He's talking to a girl named Ecclesia. I'm restoring you back to my father yes. and your father. Yes. I'm your husband, but I'm also everlasting father. Remember the name? <laughs> How can the son be the father? Because the son takes over. That's why when you got married, her father brought her to you and then handed her hand to you because you pick up where he left off. See, that's fathering, not husbandly. What does the word father mean? Source the sustainer. That's where the dowry comes from. The dowry comes from history in scripture. If a man wants to marry my daughter, then I brought her to a certain level in life. I make sure that he doesn't take her backward. He has to sustain her forward. So he has to go and get the same amount of money I have and then take her even higher. So you don't, ladies, you don't marry a, de a deficit. That's why you got divorced today. You married a deficit, not an asset. <laughs> you married a sex machine, not a father. Sustain. 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 No matter how professional a woman may be, she wants to come home to a father. God built you that way. Why am I teaching this tonight? Thank you all very much, please, so I can quit. Hey, boys, say fatherhood. fatherhood. That's why our countries are all messed up. Satan knows the secret to destroy a community. Get rid of the men. So who's in your prisons? Men. Who's domestic violence perpetrated by? Men. Who's Satan attacking with pornography and all the sex stuff? Men. Who keep abandoning women? Men. Who divorced you? Men. Who broke your heart? Men. Men are destructive. That's why Christ never chose a female for a disciple. 
He came to solve the problem. Oh, this is too deep for you. He chose the men. He said, Oh, this is too deep for you. He chose the men. He said, But the women followed. See, once males get in position, women know what to do. So being a male is such a heavy job, foundation, that most men want to be women. You all figured that one out right away, yeah? Because they don't want to carry the load. No, let me give an example. This is why, for example, okay, this is heavy. Write, write, write this down. Saturday morning and be good. Okay, write this down. A woman is a man's baby. God took her out of the meal. So she's actually his baby. And you're supposed to sustain your baby. This is why men naturally call women baby. Come on, guys. Come on, talk to me now. It's built into your genes. Hey, baby. What's happening, baby? Are you fine, baby? Sweetheart, baby. How you doing, baby? You call your wife baby. Now, isn't it amazing that your wife doesn't call you baby in return? She calls you daddy. Come on, talk to me. And the older you get in marriage, the easier it is for the say it. And the longer you've been married, I guarantee you, she's going to call you daddy. It's built into her genes. She, you are father. He returned the hearts of the children. She's also your children. To the father. Every woman in this place that's hurting right now quietly. You don't know, but that hurts. The source of it is a man. And that's why he came to heal the fathers. Get a copy of this book. You'll see what I mean. In this book, I give you the 10 ways to become an effective father again. How to restore men. That's why the church is filled with women. Satan doesn't care if women go to church. It doesn't matter. Because the foundation is the key to the building, not the roof and the windows. If you destroy this roof, the city council will not condemn this building. If you destroy the walls, break them down, they will not condemn this building. If you move all the windows, break them out, they, still won't, they won't condemn this building. It's still good to the city. But if they ever find a crack in the foundation, they condemn it, you can never build on this again. They say, get rid of it. Think about it, Garden of Eden, eh? The Bible says, Eve saw the tree, nothing happened. She picked the fruit, nothing happened. She ate it, nothing happened. She swallowed it, nothing happened. Why? She's not the foundation. It says, then she took it to her husband. Now we got problems, you see? The foundation is now about to crumble. And the Bible says, when the man ate it, the next word is suddenly. And that's why you must be faithful to your wife. When you're faithful to your wife, you are protecting the community from crime, prisons, Domestic violence, poverty, depression, just being faithful to your wife. It's hard to find a good man these days. That's why women are getting married at age 40 and 50. They, they can't find nobody. And most of the people they find are already being used up. It's their third and fourth marriage. They come with baggage. And they've not been to a seminar like this to get teaching on what to do to be a father. The church is a mess. 
Even the pastor don't know how to father his own wife. Amen. So the pastor's getting divorced every weekend. Amen. I'm sleeping with the people in the choir. Amen. I'm not sustaining their children. This is not a fathering. He will restore the hearts of the fathers. You think that's a good book? You think it's necessary? It's necessary. That's why I'm proud of you men who are 60, 70 years old and still married to the same woman and taking care of your grandkids. I'm proud of you. You, you guys are the blessing to the country. Thank you so much for staying with your wife. And if your marriage didn't work out, get knowledge first before you try again. Don't get a person, get knowledge. Get this kind of knowledge first. And if you have a man in your life, get this book and buy it for him. Tell him, read it. He'll treat you completely differently. My wife is a smart woman. You know. It's amazing how, how women think. For example, you give your wife money. I'm talking about how psyche the female now. You give your wife money. Get what she does. She gives it back to you. She said, keep it. And then when she wants it, she comes back to you. Can I have some money? Now, the reason why she does that is because she wants to feel like you are saucing her. It's psychological. That's why she keeps coming to you for money all the time. Never stops. And it drives you crazy. And you're like, I just gave you something. Yes, I know, baby. Give me some more. Because she wants to feel like you are sustaining her. That's part of her womanhood. So I keep money in my pocket just for my wife. All the time. And here she comes again. Hey, baby, here you go. And she loves it. She loves it. It makes her feel like a woman. Women want to be pampered. They were born to be sustained. That's why they say their money is theirs and yours is theirs. It's just, they're crazy. <laughs> help me, women. Help me out, women. Give me a hand. Give me a hand, ladies. <laughs> what is mine is mine, and what is yours is mine. That's how it goes, right? Yeah, they want to be sustained. I tell you right now that every woman in this place would prefer to be home if she wanted to be home. All of them. I don't care how cute they act with their briefcase and their three-piece suit. They, in their heart, they want to be at home enjoying themselves and work if they feel like going to work. Because they were created to be sustained. Sustained. I remember the day when I wrote my, my wife's resignation letter. She used to work for an oil company. She made more money than I did when we came out of college. She worked for my oil company. I worked for the government, you know, that just. And uh, I told her, I says, my job is to work you out of a job. So I'm going to work so you can leave a job. And I wrote her resignation letter two years later. I, I typed it. I thanked her boss for having her work with him. And I tell him now she's coming to work with me. I'll sustain her. We never look back. We're debt free. Kids are debt free. God's being faithful. Let me tell you something. If a man decides to sustain a woman and he's serious about it, God will bless him financially. Try it, man. It's amazing. But if a man is selfish, God will keep him broke. That's why you're broke. Not you, the one behind you. Not you, the one behind you. That's why you're struggling. Because you don't understand how to sustain your wife. Emotional sustenance. Psychological sustenance. Material sustenance. Spiritual sustenance. You're supposed to sustain her in all of those areas. Fatherhood. Everybody say father. That's why God is called the father of creation. And Hebrews 1 says, and he upholds all things that he made by the word of his power. He didn't just produce it, he sustains it. Because he is Abba. And the male is the only creature God gave that title to. So when a man ceases sustaining, 
the marriage would be destroyed. No question about it. So invest in your, in your life, brothers. And I love all you men, because I know. I just finished a men's conference in the Bahamas. You couldn't get in the room. And we released this book in Nassau this week. You couldn't get in the room. I mean, it was packed. We were on the front page of the news this week, because they'd never seen so many men who came for help. And when I finished teaching on fatherhood, the men were up front, weeping. Only one woman was in that room, and she was a reporter. I made sure another woman was in the room, because you had to deal with father problems. Men came out of rough backgrounds without fathers. 72% of all the men in prison grew up in homes without fathers. And they're angry because there wasn't a father around. That's why they hurt women. They're angry. They're angry. So may God have mercy on the men. You know, men are good, but they're just ignorant, that's all. They don't know. They weren't taught what I'm teaching you today. And those 10 things in the book, if you learn them, you'll, you'll understand what to be a man is like, what it means to be a man. Only 10 things. And I found them all right there in Genesis chapter 2. 10 things that a male needs to become a man. It's in the Bible. It's very important. All right. Let's get started. <laughs> Tell your neighbor that was good introduction. <laughs> Come on, say it. Help me out here. That was good introduction. I won't keep you long, I promise, but it's sure going to be good, okay? All right. Get your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 1. This is my theme for 2008 right there. Every year, God gives me a specific direction, and here it is. Kingdom, culture, influence. Holy Spirit said to me, for the next 10 years, this shall be the message for the world. Kingdom, culture, influence. It's our theme. I want to focus, therefore, for the next three days on kingdom influence through colonization you will finally understand Jesus' mind. Jesus Christ is the most misunderstood human on earth. He is misunderstood by the Muslims who call him a good teacher and a prophet. He's misunderstood by the Hindus who call him just another god among the six million they worship. He's misunderstood by the scientists who call him a figure who didn't exist in history. He's misunderstood by the agnostics who think that he is just a figment of their imagination, mind science. He's misunderstood by Christians who have reduced him to a religious leader who founded a religion called Christianity. Jesus Christ was not religious. Jesus Christ came to earth, but not to bring a religion. Now, I normally want to begin my sessions with this little statement. The wealthiest spot on planet earth is not the gold mines of South America. It is not the silver mines of Central America. The wealthiest spot on earth is not the diamond mines of South Africa. The wealthiest spot on earth is not the uranium mines of Europe. But the wealthiest spot on earth is not the oil fields of Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, or Saudi Arabia. The wealthiest spot on planet Earth is actually not too far from your house. You probably passed it on your way here to this conference. I found it. What is the wealthiest spot on Earth? This is how it looks. The wealthiest spot on Earth is the cemetery. 
It's the graveyard. And why is the graveyard the wealthiest spot on earth? Because the cemetery is the place where you can find books. The cemetery is a place where you can find paintings that were never painted. People died with them in their minds. The cemetery is filled with music that was never played or heard. What a rich place. The cemetery is filled with businesses that never opened, never had a customer. The cemetery is filled with ideas that was never manifested. Solutions that never found their problems. The graveyard is a wealthy place. It is filled with visions that died as nightmares and dreams. People took their visions to the cemetery. The graveyard is filled with plans that were never executed. Some of you got some in a file somewhere and the cemetery is getting closer. What a tragedy. The graveyard is filled with purposes that were never fulfilled. This is why I travel around the world. This is why I came here. I came to this conference, left my family and my staff because of this very knowledge. I knew that I would meet in this meeting today and this weekend people who are candidates to add to the wealth of the cemetery. And they are sitting in your chair right now. All of you are like a treasure chest. You came to earth loaded and getting closer to the cemetery. And you've not deposited your treasure to your generation. There are books in this room that have not been written yet. Magazines unpublished. Inventions not produced yet. Poetry not written yet. Because you keep procrastinating and postponing your treasure. Oh, what a wealthy place the cemetery is. If I could mine the graveyard, I would be a rich man. That is why I came here. I came here for one reason. I wanted to walk among the tombstones here tonight and shout at you one statement. Die empty. That's why I came here. You need to, from this night forward, whether you are five years old or 95, the fact that you are still breathing is God's proof that you are still carrying some of his stuff. The word retirement does not exist in the Bible. It's a capitalist invention. You are not supposed to die old. The Bible doesn't teach that. In God's kingdom, you are supposed to die finished. Write that down, please. You are supposed to die like Paul, the apostle. I have finished my cause. You are supposed to die empty. Paul says, I am like a drink offering that have been poured out. Nothing's left. I am now ready to be offered, he says. I'm ready to leave. Why? There's nothing else left. Don't die sick and old. Die empty, he says. You should never allow the cemetery to get anything from you. That's why you're still breathing. 
your age is incriminating. You think you are living long because God loves you. No, you're living long because God's waiting. You remember Abraham? God kept Abraham alive until the baby was born at 100 years old. He was carrying something. Die like Jesus. He was 33 years and six months old and he used these words it not I it not I now because you never finished he says it the assignment is finished what's yours that's why you're still breathing you're not here to join some religious organization and sing every weekend you came here to make a deposit on the planet and God knew that the world needed you at this time and what you carry and we need and Abraham found his at 75 years old. You have no excuse. God sent me here to tell you, cancel your retirement and write the books you came procrastinating on. Produce the poetry for the children. They're waiting. Cemetery is a thief. That's why I work so hard. Every day my life is filled with passion because I have an agreement with the graveyard. You better sign yours tonight. My agreement to the cemetery is you will get nothing. Close your eyes for a second. Say it loud. Die empty. Now say to yourself, I will die empty. Say it loud. A little louder. Come on, man. I will die empty. Live that way. I imagine Sarah, 75 years old, and God says, Hey, girl, we're just getting started. You will have this baby that will create a nation. Whatever you are carrying is supposed to affect a generation. You were never born to buy a house, a boat, and play golf. You have not contributed anything to the next generation. That's why God sent me here. He flew me in to tell you the cemetery is getting close and you are still loaded. The Bible says, therefore, maximize the years. Help me to number my days correctly. Amen. The graveyard. That's why the king wants you to understand the kingdom so badly. Because he gave you gifts to give to the earth. You are not supposed to bring back to God what he gave you. Remember when the Three servants got gifts. The one that kept it, he cursed. He says, he says, I brought it back to you. It's yours. He says, you wicked and lazy servant. You're supposed to deliver it to your generation. So why am I waiting on your books, man? I mean, your grandchildren will not know your thoughts. Think about that child book God told you to write 20 years ago. He said, write me a children's book. I gave you ideas. And the book is still trapped. So every time I pass a graveyard, I weep. We have walking cemeteries, buried dreams on two feet, going to a dumb job every day, calling it a career. Do 
Here's a verse I thought you would be interested to remember. The treasure that's on the inside. Paul said these words. Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show forth the glory of God. In other words, you were created to deposit your treasure, your gift on the earth. And you are supposed to fill the earth with your kingdom gift. That's why I work so hard. I'm on a collision course with death. And so are you. And my agreement is, debt gets nothing. I want to die like my savior, finished. Not old, finished. And that's why we're here these next three days, to help you. I want you to, to really die empty. You, you got a lot inside. The experience, the wisdom, the knowledge, all that powerful history and ideas. If you die today, we would lose it. Go and open the business in the middle of an economic crisis. Go and publish the magazine in the middle of the downturn in the economy. Start. Because whatever God calls for, he provides for. What is it you dream in? What is it that makes you uncomfortable on your job? Your gift will always frustrate you. Your gift is what you would rather be doing. Huh. Your gift is your purpose. Purpose is your reason for being born. This is why your job depresses you because your job is what you get paid to do, but your purpose is what you were born to do, and they're different. This is why you could go to a job for 60 years and retire and be depressed because you never did what you were born to do. You did what you were paid to do. So you still owe us. And that's why you're alive, mama. God says, go back and write the poetry. Leave the kids something to remember. purpose. The king has given you a gift. And it's like diamonds buried. It's a treasure. Let's read this. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7. Read it loud. Go. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power potential is from God and not from us. That means you are carrying something that doesn't belong to you. He deposited stuff in you. You were not born just to make a living. You were born to make a difference in your generation. That's why God sent me. He sent me here to stop you because you are so busy planning to do nothing. You thought your career was successful. God says, hey, you ain't done what I gave you birth to do yet. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. Turn there for a second. One of my most favorite verses in the Bible. It says this, and listen to it. Proverbs 19, 21. It says, many are the plans in a man's heart. But it is the Lord's purpose that will prevail in that man's life. What a verse. God says, you make your plans of what you want to do, what you want to be, your career, your vocation, all these plans you make where you want to live, your business. He says, you have not consulted me yet for your purpose. 
it's possible to be a successful failure. Succeeding in which you were never at. Succeeding in what you were never asked to do. Wasted life. Purpose. Gift. And that's why this series on the kingdom is so important. It helps you rediscover your royal gift. I just signed a contract with Warner Brothers, Time Mike, Time, Warner and Time Brothers, Time Magazine. Uh, for a new book project. It's coming out in November. They paid me a lot of money to write this book. Because when they, when they saw the, the content of the manuscript, they said, we want to publish this. It's going to be one of the biggest books I've ever released. The book is called In Charge. It's a leadership book. The book is on the philosophy of Jesus and his concept of leadership. What a mind he had. One day his disciples were arguing about greatness. And by the way, every person in this room wants to be great. And don't you lie to me. Some of you are frustrated because you haven't made it yet and you've been around for 70 years. But you want to be great. No human does not want to be great. And in this book, I talk about the fact that the, the desire for greatness is normal and divine. If you have no desire to be great, you are not normal. You are in denial. As a matter of fact, Jesus did not discourage the desire for greatness. He encouraged it. Let me prove it. The Bible says, he overheard them arguing and saying, who is the greatest among us? And he called them aside and said unto them, if anyone desires to be great. I'm quoting him now. He did not discourage them. He did not attack the desire. He actually showed them how to achieve it. If anyone, how many? Anyone, why? He knows that everyone wants it. If anyone wants to be great, he says, they must become the slave to everyone and the servant to everyone. Yes. What does he mean? Oh, this is good stuff. Yes. When I did the research on the word servant, slave, it blew my mind. It had nothing to do with subservience. The word he used means <laughs> to deploy yourself yes. to the world. If you want to be great, serve your gift to the world. To do that then, you must first discover your gift. And that's your problem. You haven't found your treasure. That's why you got a job. All the great people in the world, genuinely great people, if you study them, and in this book I do a lot of research on these people, starting with Abraham himself. When you discover your gift, you automatically become great. Tiger Woods never went to a school of greatness, never took a course in leadership, Never took a course in marketing. Never took a course in supervisory or management. And the guy is influencing the world. 
he found a gift. And he serves it to the world. When you find your gift, they will find you. I'm going to say it again. When you find your gift, they will find you. This is why if you want to be a failure, be an imitation. You were not born to imitate other people. You were born to be yourself. Mother Teresa, what a woman, never went to a college. She was a high school teacher in India. Left her job because she found her gift. Helping the poor. She refined it. And guess what? She spoke to the United Nations. Greatness. The future of a seed is not ahead of the seed. It's trapped in the seed. Your future is not ahead of you. God hides your future where he knows you can't miss it. And you keep looking for it. That's why you can't find it. <laughs> it reminds me of a story of a man who lived in Texas, a true story. This is guy owned a farm in Texas and, and uh, the whole area was just farms, just like this area some years ago. And, and one day he heard the news from the West Coast that they had struck oil and they found gold out there. And he decided, I want to strike it rich. I want to be wealthy. I want to be great. And so he put his farmer for sale. And the farm was probably worth seventy, eighty thousand dollars. He sold it for thirty-eight thousand dollars, cheap, because he wanted the money quickly to go and buy some donkeys and some pickaxes, and he wanted gold to prospect on the west coast for gold and oil, and he wanted to strike it rich. And he bought the donkeys and went west. Three months later, the man who he bought the farm, sold the farm to, who was his neighbor, was out dealing with the cows, and he began to dig for more water on the same farm. The guy sold it for $38,000, and this black stuff started coming up out of the soil, and he began to realize that this is the largest deposit in Texas of oil. It's a true story. And that man, in an instant, became one of the wealthiest men in America from a $38,000 farm. When the man on the West Coast got the news <laughs> that the farm he left and sold, that he was sitting on all his life, was grounded in oil, he fell off his donkey, they said, and had a heart attack. He died. What's the moral of the story? What you're looking for is right where you are. So I've come here to dig for oil right in you. You're listening to me. Your future is trapped. You are treasure carriers. Your gift is waiting to be deployed. Amen. And the problem is you've been employed. You work all your life for that company, man, and never became yourself. When the book comes out, please buy it. It'll change your life forever. Because we've got to get the six billion people on earth to discover the gift so the world could be filled with the glory of God. If 
people find their gift, there will be no more crime. Wow. You know, in the book I talk about, I got this revelation from the Holy Spirit. He says, he says, you know, greatness is like a seed becoming a tree. You know, if, uh, watch this. If you take an apple seed and you plant it, it becomes an apple tree right from the inside of the seed. And it becomes fruitful, apple fruit. Now, here's something about trees with fruit. Fruit is the gift. Trees will never bring their fruit to you. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. If you want their fruit, what you got to do? Go to them. You see, when you find your gift, they will come to you for it. I watched Tiger was the other day, and 3,000 people walking up and down the golf course behind his little fellas. Yes, trim. They come to him. They, they, he, 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 he gets going back. They go back. Hey, boys, oh, he come back. back. Hey, this, this, I mean, this, this young fella, he even ain't 38 years old yet. He got them old folks running behind him, watching him. Why? They're following the fruit. How come no one's looking for you? Because we can't find your fruit. This year, I have received over 800 invitations to speak in one year. 800. I never once gave out a card. I refined my gift. I refined my gift. You are loaded. Don't let the cemetery get it. In the book, I talk about how everybody is actually named Jack. That's why they ain't great. It's either Jack or Jacqueline. Or Jackie. You know, Jack of all the trades, but they master nothing. And that's your problem. One thing with an with a apple tree, it never grows mangoes. It never grows bananas. It never grows oranges. It only grows apples. How come we confuse with you? You keep changing your career. What are you known for? That's your greatness. Deep inside of you is a gift screaming. Let me out. Your energy is trapped in your gift. If you feel tired, it's because you haven't found your gift. You have no energy, you feel sluggish and lazy, you haven't found your gift. If you found your gift, you wake up early in the morning and go to bed late. That's why the Bible calls it slave. You become a slave, not to the people, but to your gift. You serve it so much, you become a slave to it. And they call you great. So while you're sleeping, I got to study, you see. So when you wake up, I can teach you. I'm the slave, not you. So you think I'm a great teacher. I'm up all night and you're sleeping. Who's really the slave? See, that's, that's what I mean by greatness. The Bible says a little slumber, a little sleep, and poverty takes you like a, band, a bandit. You see, if you don't find your gift, then all you get is a salary. Mm. Oh, I wish I could be here for a couple more days. See, that's why consultants get paid more than employees. <laughs> consultants have a gift. What you got is a trade. And there's a difference. He, Jesus said, even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve himself a ransom. He is a ransom. He's like, serve ransom. That's what makes me great. Wow. 
What do you serve us? What were you born to give us before you die? What were you born to give us before you die? See, no one ever asked you the right questions. You weren't born just to be a wife. You were born to deliver to me and my children something. This place is a man's gift. That man. That's what keeps him so young. You are never supposed to die sick and tired. You're supposed to just leave because you're finished. Clap. Just a few more minutes, I want to pray. I want you to, to take this with you, and then we're going to. I'm so glad you, how many of you are glad you came tonight? Let me see your hands. You, are you feeling this? You, okay, see God knows exactly where you are at. That's why he brought you here. You are at a point in your life where you need to change. Something is uneasy in your life. That's why God brought you here. You're at the point where you know what you're doing and ain't what you really want to do. He set you up tonight to make sure you live effectively before you die. That's why God brought you here. Now, I want to, to prepare you for tomorrow morning. The secret to greatness is influence. <laughs> greatness is measured by influence. Influence is a product of significance. Significance is a product of value. Please buy this CD. Listen to it 10 times in the car. I'm telling you. At the end of the meeting, go back and buy the CD. Because I'm saying some things, you ain't got it right away. You got to hear it seven times. I'm going to say it again. Influence is a product of significance. Significance is a product of value. Value is a product of refinement. Refinement is a product of uniqueness. Yes. Uniqueness is a product of gift. And God gave you a gift. Every human came to earth with a gift. You ever wonder why God never told Adam, read my lips, read my lips, read my lips, look at my lips. He never told Adam, be seedful. This is deep now. His first command, first command to the human, first command, be fruitful. It's impossible to be fruitful unless you have seed. Fruit is a product of seed. Oh. The word fruitful in the Hebrew language does not mean to have children. <laughs> The word means, write this down, to be productive. Productive. Produce something, God told Adam. Produce. You cannot produce without seed. So God never told him to be seedful because he knew he had already put seed in every human. What God wants is fruit, a product. What's your product? The market needs your product. Yes. And I guarantee 90% of the people in this room have never found their product. All they got is a career. You cannot retire from your gift. So if you are retired, that's proof you never found your gift. An apple tree can never retire from being an apple tree. Are you understand what I'm saying? You, you, you do not read. Dr. Gerald Deustein can never quit this. This will kill him. 
He will die doing this. Why? You don't retire from your gift. God says, Adam, produce something. God's commands indicate what you possess. I'm going to say it again. Write it down. God's commands indicate what you already possess. In other words, God will never demand what he didn't already supply. Whatever God calls for, he provides for. If God calls for fruit, he's already provided seed. So every human came to earth with a seed of greatness. And the cemetery keeps getting it. Everybody's the influence. influence. We're going to talk about this tomorrow all day. Kingdom, culture, influence. You and I were born to influence the generation before we die. And let me tell you something. Some of you think that you got to be the prime minister or the president or the governor. Let me tell you something. Mother Teresa was a high school teacher. And never stopped being who she is. She found her gift and left her career. I'm going to say it again. She found her gift and left her career. Her career was teaching. Her gift was helping the poor. But when she found a gift, she couldn't stay in the classroom. Write this down. Your gift is what makes you angry. She became angry every time she saw those poor people laying in the streets of Calcutta. As a missionary teacher, she couldn't take it anymore. She would step over those lepers on her way to the classroom and she'd be weeping as she walked over those poor people just to get to the classroom, laying on the streets. She said in a book, she says, she said she couldn't take it anymore. She became angry at poverty and sickness. Let me tell you something. You were born to do what makes you angry. Spend the next three days on this beautiful premises. Go and take a walk in the trees, in the quietness of that forest. Please do it. And ask God to reveal to you your anger. Be like Moses when he saw. What makes you angry? When he saw the Egyptian oppressing one Hebrew, he was already a prince. That's why God ain't impressed by your nice job. He sacrificed his career as a prince to go after his anger. He was born to set them free. What makes you angry? Every time Jesus saw the effects of sin and oppression, the Bible says he became angry. They call it move with compassion. It was anger. He was born to set them free. You know what makes me angry? When I see potential unreleased. That's why I feel angry tonight. It's my anger that makes me teach you so good. I'm a good teacher, right? Yes, sir. It's anger. <laughs> because I don't want to see the cemetery take another gift that we're supposed to get. And it's sitting in your body. <laughs> Influence. And so this is uh, my passion for the year. Kingdom culture influence. You are supposed to influence the culture before you die. And you do that by discovering your kingdom gift. And we're going to study the kingdom the next two days. I don't know who you are, don't know where you came from, I don't know how old you are, but I'm telling you, God sent me just for you. 
just for you. You're going to start again. They ain't seen nothing yet. Come on, give them a praise. They, they thought they knew you, huh? There you are. Every one of us supposed to affect the world. I know it sounds crazy, but you are. I still live on an island seven miles wide. And millions are affected by me. And I still go back to that island. I wonder what you're carrying. We need you. We need what you're carrying. You think Christ died for you. He really didn't. He died for what you're carrying. That's why the Bible says you are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. For what reason? To do good works that were prepared for you before. The foundation of the world. He saved you to finish your work, not to go to heaven. Influence. That's your goal. Your goal is to transform society through kingdom influence.